Hey, does anyone else remember that Christopher Lambert guy? He was in movies, right? Apparently he still is, and he's never gotten tired of being the weird, sword-wielding, immortal jackanade who speaks with a really bizarre cadence. You know, he might just be a subpar actor. Now, I understand that he's a cult favorite, and most of his fan base probably doesn't want to hear this, but it would honestly take a complete transformation to turn him into a good performer. Yeah, some kind of shapeshift or some sort of complete change in being. Some kind of metamorphosis. What the? A text crawl? You're killing me, movie. This is the third flick in like three months that started with a long exposition dump. Alright, I am not sitting through this. This movie is about Elizabeth Bathory, whom they are calling Elizabeth because fuck you, that's why. If you're not familiar with the legend of Elizabeth Bathroom, here's a quick recap. Elizabeth Batherby was a countess in somewhere or another Europe around the turn of the 17th century. Her husband went to war against the Ottomans and left her home, bored, and apparently unable to find a hobby or a servant to have a good old-fashioned wholesome affair with. In the absence of television or Tumblr, she went mad, obsessed over her declining youth and worried that her husband would not want her upon his return. Also, she was apparently certain that he would return, which is some pretty wishful thinking considering that he was on the losing side of the long war. This kind of openness to hopeful fantasy is important to her character, as she began to delve into witchcraft as a means of passing the time without passing her prime. Don't get confused, this isn't the kind of harmless witchcraft you find in New Age shops and prayer circles. Nope. No sooner had she begun to visualize a blue flame than she started murdering virgins and bathing in their blood. Yeah, that's the conclusion she came to. I guess she must have got her beauty tips from the girls at Bloodbath and Beyond. Yeah, so there you go. Crazy bitch gets all full of Satan and goes shithouse on some children. The locals find this thing kind of sort of unacceptable, so they executed her servants and boarded her up in a castle where she died four years later, presumably still Tom Cruise crazy. And so that's where our story begins. The townsfolk have had enough of her murderous ways, and they intend to let her know in a sternly worded bulletin and a house arrest. This is kind of neat. They decided to be true to the origin of Bat Horsey legend and translated all of the dialogue into the native language of her people. Klingon. Well, I hope they aren't going to treat her to the Caligula surprise. That wouldn't be cool. Probably bad politics, because her children would still inherit lordship and all that. Now that you mention it, where the hell are the rest of her children? This movie acts like the bad story rulership just kind of vanished after this. What about Catalan or Paul? What about Georgi, Orsley, Miklos, or Andres? You know what? I don't think this film is nearly as historically accurate as it's painting itself to be. Flashing forward to the modern day, Christopher Lambert screams his way into the movie as he aggravates a bunch of Hungarians. He's trying to stop them from burying his brother here, as per his last will. He's having some trouble communicating with them because people named Konstantin Terzo, who have brothers in small Hungarian villages, often have no knowledge whatsoever of Slavic. Then again, maybe he is speaking their language, but they aren't fluent in perpetuous scream. Seriously, this guy delivers every line at top volume. I thought Chris Lambert was blind, not deaf. Well, whatever the linguistic barrier that separates them, the priest ignores his wishes, angrily blesses the grave, and has Fat Harry Dresden here put a stake through the corpse's heart. Huh. That's an odd custom. Maybe it's a Catholic thing? Fanciful robes, elaborate ceremonies, perforated corpses? I don't know. Something tells me that that isn't part of the canon. Oh hey, now our lives are complete. A bunch of annoying college-age kids just sort of irritating their way across the countryside. <sighs> it's good to be back, folks. The Scooby Squad have a discussion about how old things can be hot because of Kevin Costner. No, really. And then stop to ask Sir Ian McGoatheard where the Baggerbly Castle is. The Highlander sneaks into the graveyard to steal his brother's corpse as the Jerk Brigade stop to avoid a car that is parked at the side of the road. While wandering through a graveyard in the middle of nowhere, they meet a mysterious girl in white who is immediately crammed headfirst into being the main character's love interest. I'm sure that I've actually heard all of these people's names, but I don't feel like remembering them. I'm just going to call these two Jackass and Nitwit, and this one Mac since he kind of looks like that guy from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. So, Mac just picks this chick up. Why is no one asking any questions about this lady? She's just standing in the middle of nowhere, dressed like she's on her way to a Chicago goth club, and she speaks perfect English, and she's willing to just get in the car and go with him. 
In all honesty, this should probably throw up some red flags. I'm gonna go with, it's a ghost, morons! It's a ghost! And bam! Ha <laughs> ha Broke your mirror, bitch! After some driving, they arrive at a monastery and are treated to a series of awful speeches, including a priest who tells them all about purgatory and nitwit droning on for ages about something that was, like, not really old, but, like, you know, they made it look all old so they could, like, totally charge more money or something, you know? It reminds me of a motel I stayed in once. It looked really old like this, except it wasn't. They just made it look old so they could charge more, but it just looked old and... Ugh, I thought we were done with Annoying Valley Girls after Night of the Comet. All right, Valley Girl Remix, everybody. Any excuse for more Zappa? Valley Girl, she's a Valley Girl. Valley Girl, she's a Valley Girl. Stop that. So Mac and the girl in white, whom I'm going to hitherto refer to as Galadriel, why? Mysterious woman in the woods, wearing all white, and clearly as much of a threat as a boon. Anyway, she and Matt continue to discuss how they have opposing genitals, so they must be perfect for each other. To really drive home the whole soulmate thing, Mac reveals that, when he was little, he memorized a poem in ancient Hungarian just because he thought it sounded cool. And hey, wouldn't you know it? She can not only translate it, but she's familiar with it. Apparently, she's also very interested in the 17th century as well. GHOST! I've really got to agree with him. This really is shaping up to be a ghost story. Yeah, you guys should probably take notice of all the signs that this lady is a ghost! Well, hey. I guess that she's at least corporeal enough that he could fuck her. Good thing, otherwise we wouldn't get to see Mac's ass. Well, I think that's all we were hoping for out of this movie. This guy's ass. I disagree. I was hoping for Christopher Lambert's ass, but the night is still young. Ooh, bad call, dude. Check it out. She's not a ghost after all. She's a vampire. Well, she's not a very good one. There's no biting, only banging. I wonder if she sparkles in the sun. The priest shows up and tells Team Oblivious that he is unable to provide a guide to the castle. Apparently the wolves are attacking and he thinks it's unsafe. Luckily for the movie, Mac isn't concerned with the safety of his friends, himself, or his obvious love interest so he gets her to lead them to the castle. While the dumb squad dickers about until they manage to lose the only set of keys they have, the priest and Galadriel have a staring contest. I think she just hates that spooky music. The priest finally figures this out and hits the pause button on Zycross. Father, is there any place in the village where we can rent a car? I think there is. They head into town to rent a car and decide to stop for food. At the restaurant, however, Mac makes the mistake of flashing a wad of money, which attracts the attention of Hungarian bulk and skull here. But never fear, because Vampire Girlfriend unleashes her best Power Rangers martial arts moves in defense of her bow, and vanquishes the other with a full force thriller reveal, commenting, I hate evil people. The hooligans don't stop them, but Jackass's jackass driving sure does. Those Duke boys have sure enough gotten themselves in a pickle this time. They better commence to grow in themselves some wings, or at least start flapping their arms. Improbably enough, all four seem to have come through unharmed. They press on, eventually running into a pair of fellow tourists, a priest, and a nun. Wait, all these people were supposed to have been killed by wolves. What gives, movie? Well, we aren't the only ones questioning this. It's so obvious that even Jackass is calling shenanigans and accusing them of being specters. Wait a minute, a phantasmal Catholic priest? R -r 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 ghost! Regardless, Father Might Be Dead agrees to take them to the castle. Before they can leave, though, Mac's girlfriend disappears, leaving behind a cryptic message and her necklace. As they travel through the wolf-infested forest, they're suddenly attacked by wombats. Just kidding. I mean wolves. Fortunately, the wolves realize what movie this is, and they decide to get the hell out of there as fast as they possibly can. The Scooby gang finally reaches Castle Anthrax. After a few minutes of being stalked by a Foley artist doing footsteps, they stumble to the opening to Tales from the Crypt. You know, the more time we spend inside the castle, the less authentic the place looks. The actual Bathory Castle is a dilapidated ruin, people. Alright, up until now, we've gone really easy on Nitwit, but she is, hands down, the most annoying character in this entire movie. She's like a full-grown version of Kimmy from Full House. Uh, actually, her character's name is Kim. Is there a bathroom around here somewhere? 
I've got it. She's like a cross between Kimmy and Teeth. Hey, if I'm not back in half an hour, either I'm lost or I can't find any loop paper. I can't figure out what her deal is. Every time she opens her mouth, it's either to babble nonsense or to mention she's going to the bathroom. And why would an American tourist ask for loo paper? So, uh, did somebody say my name? Uh, you guys looking for me? Wait, who are you? I'm loo paper. Oh, good. I was afraid it would be someone random and silly. Yeah, so, um, did you guys want something? Oh, um, nothing really. Uh, some chick named Kim was looking for you. Really? I haven't seen Kimmy in years! I'll catch you guys later. <sighs> so glad it wasn't something random and silly. No, oh, hey, the movie's still going. Let's see. Nitwit is being stalked by a POV shot. The Holy Ghost exposits about how the necklace vampire girlfriend left behind means she must really be the daughter of Countess Bathory, oh, and everybody else busies themselves being generally unlikable. We get several long minutes of exposition delivered by Father Plot Dump and the Lying Nun. It turns out that Christopher Lambert is the descendant of that buff guy with bad hair from the prologue. The one who locked up the Countess and stole her land. Ever since, the Torzo family has borne a hereditary curse, dooming them to Highlander sequel after Highlander sequel, and rendering them incapable of speaking below a scream. Oh, and they also die a lot. What do you think she meant? Search for the white light. I have never heard about such light. You are a priest, sir! Check it out. Those will eventually grow up to be my girlfriend's tits. Nitwit manages to get dragged off into the dark by that renegade POV shot we mentioned earlier, somehow leaving behind a trail of blood. This touches off that part of every Scooby-Doo episode where everyone scatters and gets chased around the spooky mansion. Boris and Natasha here decide that the Americans must be in cahoots with Moose and Squirrel, so they go off alone to find secret formula. What they find instead is Christopher Vampert, who bursts through the door and displays his vampirish glory for all to see. Interesting. I've been stabbed, and I've been hanged. Even broken on the rack once, but I've never been shot before. It kind of itches a little. Christopher Lambert no-sells everything they throw at him, and then proceeds to bad-speak the hell out of this scene. Seriously, it's as though they let him ad-lib his dialogue, and he decided to transform this movie into a bad skit from Creep Show. Natasha tries to hold him at bay with a crucifix. You have to have faith for this to work on me, Mr. Vincent. Father soon dead and Sister Gunnabite help Jackass find Kim. Unfortunately, she's been transformed into a vampire, so they finally have an excuse to kill her. Kimmy! No! Vampert catches up with Mac and gives him a good old-fashioned ass-kicking. That is until Galadriel swoops in to save the day. She does this by vamp-fooing him all over the place. Ultimately, her flying wave technique is no match for his bad actor choose the scenery style, and she is overpowered. Vampert then sinks his fangs into her neck. At which point she just stops struggling and lets him. Wait, why does she do that again? In true arch-villain style, Vampert elaborates on his plan to make her suffer, and then he fucks off to go kill Mac. But first, he runs into the canonical fodder. Vampert menaces him until the priest is... abducted by aliens? He was summoned to the great Pope Mobile in the sky. Meanwhile, Jackass manages to escape from a causality loop, only to run afoul of Vampert, who does what I've been wanting to do this whole time. He tosses his ass off a balcony. The vampire just killed you. Dumbass. So Mac finally finds the bad special effect that Galadriel told him to look for. Unfortunately, Vampert has beaten him to the punch. The Bathberry girl shows up, confusing Vampert as to which one he wants to kill first. He alternates between choking Mac and Vampirella for a while, then screams at what we can only assume is his career. Nothing will save him! Nothing! After giving Mac what should have been a fatal beating, he pauses to bad touch Vampirella for a while. Hey! What? Ah! Has anyone ever told you that you look beautiful when you're dying? With Vampert's posturing and one-liners put to rest, the movie finally enters its denouement. Surprise! It was all a dream. It was all a stupid fucking dream! No, seriously, none of that really happened. It was all a part of some other dimensional purgatory that may or may not have been misfiring neurons in Mac's dying brain. So, the real events of this movie are as follows. Idiots go to Hungary. Idiots meet a vampire. Idiots meet a cliffside. 
primary idiot becomes a vampire. That is all. Well, that was Metamorphosis. What do we think? This movie is a mess. It begins as a sort of pseudo-historical vampire flick, but then it turns around and tries to go all Donnie Darko on us. By the end of it, it's so convoluted and pointless that it collapses under the weight of its own stupidity. You know what I got this movie? I really wanted it to be about Kafka, but it wasn't. I guess it was sort of Kafka-esque. So, good job, Metamorphosis. Your one big accomplishment is proving to me that the term Kafka-esque can be applied to bullshit also. Dear God, this movie is boring. The plot makes fuck all sense, the actors aren't very good, and in the end, everything that happens doesn't even matter. We sat through this for nothing. It's not space zombie bingo bad, but it is definitely not worth a watch unless you're a diehard Christopher Lambert fan. Lambert is the real standout, though. His performance here is so horrendous, so over the top, and so gleefully hammy that it just defies description. It's almost surreal. Hey, did anybody else notice that Vampert was the good guy in this movie? He's only a vampire because he was targeted by Elizabeth's daughter, and she only targeted him as a victim because one of his ancestors brought her mother to justice? Why do they think that she's sympathetic in any way? I hate evil people. Pathetic would be a more accurate description. We're Film Inflicted Trauma. Thanks for watching. I hate evil people.